So for tonight's speaker, one of my favorite paleontologists, oh. <laughs> who I've had some good adventures with. Definitely. Oh. Well, this will be a pretty brief introduction. Uh, but you know, Randy's got a lot of connections to Northern Arizona, where I, I was at the Museum of Northern Arizona for a lot of years. And, uh, I kind of picked up on his existence through you know, Dave Gillette and, and those guys when you were working, I guess, on the res on uh, some, some stuff with him mm -hmm. at one point. Uh, we thought, thought of Randy and uh, uh, Jeff Marks and Sterling Nedbit, this whole group of Triassic workers as the Young Turks, you know, coming up. And uh, man, we were right. <laughs> uh, but Randy got his PhD at Berkeley. He's been working in the Triassic all over the planet and other rock units, like spanning the tr the Mesozoic at this point, but all <laughs> beyond the Permian, you know, before the, the roots of it. So uh, the Young Turks have all done really well, and Randy's our own shining example of that. So the Young Turks of the Triassic uh, uh, had some good graduates. But we're not young anymore. Well, we're know, balding. I, and, I always yeah. think of you guys. <laughs> Because I remember I'm watching you guys uh, huddling on the outcrop and, on field trips. And like, yeah, there's, there's the young classic Turks. Over there. <laughs> uh, anyway. Great. Thanks, Jim. Well, thanks, everyone, for attending both in person and online. Um, it's great to be back, uh, actually, you know, in one room together here, but also expand our audience online. Um, so hopefully I can start the talk without messing up any of the sensitive uh, technological balance here. We'll see. Uh, but um, so let's see, is it going to advance? Perfect. All right. Excellent. So thanks again for the invitation to, to have a conversation with you today. Um, I just want to start out by emphasizing that the work I'm presenting here is really total, very much collaborative, involving a whole bunch of folks. Um, colleagues as well as um, staff and volunteers and students who have all been involved in this project and I see a couple of co-authors online so uh, hopefully I don't say anything wrong we'll see um, but uh, this has been a really awesome collaborative project with folks really across not only at institutions across North America but actually folks um, in Europe as well and um, I just want to say some of the research I'm presenting here, you're getting a sneak preview of. It's going to be coming out as a feature article in about 10 days. So please don't mention it on social media until the paper's actually out. So, um, but we're excited to be on the cover of the journal. So, um, so how, how did this all start? Um, well, the, really the central question is asking how this really weird bone bed in the middle of Nevada uh, formed. And it's in the middle of the desert right now, but back uh, 230 million years ago in the Triassic, it was in the shallow ocean um, off the western coast of what's now North America. And this may look like a bunch of rock, but preserved in this, um, this bedding plain here are a bunch of very large marine reptiles. Um, and they're the slightly darker um, areas, but we'll highlight that a little bit more in a moment. Um, and so that was really the central question that started this off. Um, and this is a place called Berlin Ichthyosaur State Park. And it's named that because it was the site of a silver mining town in the late 19th and early 20th century named Berlin. That's now a ghost town you can go visit. And then in West Union Canyon, just next to it, in the foothills of the Shoshone Mountains, there are all these amazing marine Triassic outcrops that have ammonites and clams and all things, sorts of things preserved, as well as ichthyosaurs. Um, these ichthyosaurs uh, were first recognized in the 1930s by local residents and uh, by, uh, by paleontologists, um, but they didn't really get studied in a serious way until the 1950s. Um, and, um, this map here is a geologic map, so all the blue colors are different Triassic marine rocks that have fossils in them. Um, and the work in the 50s was done by Charles Camp, who's a paleontologist at the University of California, Berkeley. And um, his teams found this amazing site that's represented in some of these field photos on the map up top that has 
at least half a dozen skeletons of these giant ichthyosaurs, these giant marine reptiles. And as they uncovered it, they realized, kind of like Dinosaur National Monument, this would be an amazing place to leave the bones in situ and so people could come and visit them and see them in the ground. And so that's what they did. They ended up building a building all over it. It's not as big as Dinosaur National Monument, but um, it's preserved the, uh, the bones in the ground from the, the, the uh, elements. And here's the document for when they had the opening. I really wish I could be a member of the revived order of the ichthyosaur, but I guess you had to be there for the opening, uh, sadly. And um, one of the things that often gets forgotten is that they didn't just find ichthyosaurs at that one place where they built the building. There's ichthyosaur bones and skeletons throughout the area. And in fact, here's another site uh, that they're excavating where they found four different skeletons of ichthyosaurs in close proximity. Um, and then there are many other finds throughout this little canyon. Um, and so it's not just a story about that one bone layer, bone bed, uh, but in fact why there are so many giant ichthyosaurs throughout West Union Canyon. Um, and Charles Camp eventually described, uh, scientifically described this giant ichthyosaur in the 1970s, just before he died. Um, he named it Shonisaurus popularis. And uh, here are some reconstructions. The first is a bas-relief sculpture that's at the park that you can check out. And just for a sense of scale, there's an adult human there in the background. So these are literally school bust sized uh, marine reptiles. Um, and this is a reconstruction that's at the Nevada State Museum. Um, and because of this discovery and making this a site that you could visit, it ended up being designated as Nevada's state fossil and is still Nevada's state fossil today. Of course, when they first designated it, they, you know, you can tell politicians don't understand taxonomy because they just uh, designated the ichthyosaur in general as the state fossil and then realized later on that they probably should specify Shonisaurus. Um, and so they had to pass another law to specifically make it Shonisaurus once they realized there are ichthyosaurs found throughout the world. So. Uh, but nonetheless, Shonisaurus popularis is the state fossil of Nevada, which is really cool. Um, and what's really interesting about this site is that although this, this animal is well known in the sense that people have you know, heard of Shonisaurus or they heard of Berlin Ichthyosaurus State Park, there's still a lot we don't know about it scientifically. Um, and um, I should also mention it's featured on local microbrews as well, like Icky IPA here. Um, so, um, but yeah, there's still a lot that it remains unknown about this animal and why, how these sites formed, et cetera. And a number of different um, researchers over the years have done work there. Um, and you know, look, trying to understand how the site form or revising our understanding about the animal itself. But really a lot still remain to be a mystery. And so really the central question is, what killed all these Shonisaurus? Why are they all there? Why are all their skeletons there? And at least in the site that's covered by the building, why are there so many skeletons on one single bedding plane there? Was it like represented in this cartoon? Was it, a, you know, these animals beached themselves as a group and then died, kind of like we see in modern whales today? Or did some sort of environmental cataclysm happen, some sort of you know, big volcanic eruption that made um, it toxic to live in the ocean and kill these animals off? Or did something else happen that we're not really sh sure? So that was really what our, our research group was trying to figure out. Um, and how, how this got started is uh, by these four folks up on the screen. So um, Neil Kelly at the time, he's now a professor at Vanderbilt University, but he was a postdoc at the Smithsonian with my friend Nick Pyanson. And they got interested in this question about why all these uh, giant ichthyosaurs are preserved there and started a project. And then at the same time, independently, Dr. Paula Noble at the University of Nevada, Reno and her uh, undergraduate student at the time, Paige DiPolo, got interested in it in, this, in a similar question. And so the four of them joined forces. And then uh, Nick invited me to be a part of it because we had worked on some similar projects back when we were graduate students. And so that's, that's how we got started. Um, 
And really the first major challenge is how do you study a big bone bed like this that's exposed to over tens of square meters that you know, has these really giant skeletons and um, would be hard to map accurately? Well, thankfully, uh, Nick had a, a problem or had the same problem uh, a few years before when he was studying fossil whales down in Chile. So th they were about to expand the Pan American Highway in the coast of Chile, and um, they found all these amazing skeletons of large baleen whales. And the same issue was how do we gather all these data in a time efficient man manner before the bones have to be removed for the construction project? So Nick's colleagues from the Smithsonian 3D digitization office came down and they laser scanned and made 3D models of those, uh, those whale skeletons. And we figured this would be a perfect application also for Berlin Ichthyosaur State Park with all these giant skeletons. It's hard to visualize, but if we can make an accurate 3D model, then you can manipulate it, you know, you can zoom in and out, you can label things, stuff like that. So that was the first step here. So uh, Nick's colleagues came in, they did a, um, a combination of laser scanning and also what's called photogrammetry where you take many different photos from different angles. And then a computer program uses trigonometry to match points in those photos and create an accurate 3D model. And from that, this is, uh, this is the top down view of the 3D model. Uh, and um, when the paper's published, this model will be put online and public for the public to view, and any of you can go online, manipulate it, download it, check it out. Um, it'll be on the Smithsonian, Smithsonian's Voyager website. Um, now, you look at it and you're going to tell me, Randy, that just looks like a bunch of rock. And you're right, it does look like a bunch of rock. Uh, because it's really, the bones are a very similar color to, uh, to the uh, rock surrounding them. So here we've color coded the bones, the skeletons, and each color is a, what we interpret as a different individual. And there appear to be six to seven individuals there. Um, it's a little bit hard to see on the screen for those in the room, but the orange, there's an orange skeleton and a yellow skeleton on the right side there. Um, I, I have an image in a moment that's a little bit clearer. Um, they're all preserved on one rock layer, but because of faulting, those are the straight lines you see, things have shifted up and down slightly. And so this is another view. Here we've just uh, highlighted the skeletons up top and then the, the sort of color outlines down at the bottom. And that maybe gives you a better sense of the distribution of the bones in this quarry. And one of the, once we have this, we can look at, we can actually gather some data and look at you know, some clues that might tell us about how this site formed. So up top here, this is uh, just telling each row is a skeleton and then each column is a different region of the body. And what this shows us is that the skull and the tail and the ends of the paddles are underrepresented, whereas the ribs and the limbs and the backbone are overrepresented. So we don't have perfectly complete skeletons preserved here. Their parts are missing, even though a lot of the bones are still in life position. Uh, down below we have what's called the rose diagram and that just shows you the orientation. So the longer the wedges are, the more things have the same orientation. And hopefully you can see is that most of the skeletons are oriented in the same direction. So that seems to suggest water uh, may have played a role in transporting or at least shifting these skeletons. They weren't simply killed and then buried right away. Um, there's evidence they were modified after they you know, hit the seafloor, so to speak. Uh, but we also wanted to look in more into the geology and see what clues those could give us. And so we spent a lot of time digging trenches. Um, you know, this makes me think back to my, my parents always uh, sort of threatened me that if I didn't get good grades, I wouldn't become a paleontologist and I would have to get a job digging ditches. Well, you know, after uh, nine years of higher education, I am still digging ditches, um, and it is definitely a key part of paleontology, so the joke's on them. Um, but one of the reasons we had to do this, even though this is in a desert, is that some of the rocks are limestone, which is very resistant to weathering and sticks out, but other 
parts of the rocks are this soft mudstone that weathers a lot. And so we had to dig trenches into that soft mudstone to expose fresh rock that you could actually see features of that's not altered by modern weathering. Um, and that helps us take, describe the details of the geology. It let us take samples for geochemical analysis and also um, identify some of the invertebrate fossils that are preserved here, um, including uh, things like ammonites. And we were not the first to work on the invertebrates. There's been some, a lot more really good work by others on that. And so what did we discover from this? Well, this is a little bit complicated diagram, but I'll just highlight a few things. The first is that um, we confirmed what others had suspected, that the, the skeletons of Shonisaurus are in different layers. They're not all in one layer, but they're spread throughout at least several dozen, if not 100 meters of different thick of, of layers. Um, so there's repeated uh, skeletons being preserved through time here. Um, also, um, when we look at the, the geology, some of the bones that are high, the, the layers highlighted in blue, some of the bones are preserved in the mudstone, some of them are in the limestone. And um, when we looked at the chemistry of the carbon that's preserved, which can tell you a lot about paleoenvironment, there's no evidence of big changes in the carbon at the same layer as where the bones are. So if you expected some sort of environmental cataclysm to happen and kill off these, these animals, you might expect there to be a big shift in the carbon values um, where the bones are preserved, but we don't see that. Um, and then we can look um, in more detail, we can make thin sections of the rock that the bones are preserved in. And these ignore the sort of vertical cracks, but you'll see lots of sub-parallel, sub-horizontal thin lines. Those are all shells of mollusks and brachiopods, and they're all mixed together in different orientations. They've, they're not articulated, so the two halves are apart. And that's a really good clue because that tells us that, at least occasionally, there's higher energy um, in this system. Um, but then other times it's really low energy and quiet because that's you've got mud being deposited and mud only gets deposited in really low energy environments. So from this, we think we're sort of, we're on the continental shelf, but um, we're sort of below, deeper than, um, than parts of the water column that get affected by regular waves, everyday waves, but we're shallower than the parts um, that are, uh, that avoid getting affected by storms. So we talk about fair weather wave base, that's as far down as like sort of regular waves get, and then storm wave base, which is much deeper when you get these big storms roll through. And so we're sort of in between the two. And this is, you know, in part, all these shells are probably being transported by some of these storm events. And that's, this is the type of rock that surrounds some of these ichthyosaur fossils, including the ones in the big bone bed that's covered by the building. Um, and then finally, we looked at one other chemical signature, which is mercury. So mercury in the sediment is a really good tracer of really big volcanic eruptions. And there was some idea that there might have been really big volcanic eruptions um, in the area um, further north uh, in what's now southern Alaska. Um, and called the Rangelia Large Igneous Province. And so we wanted to see, is there any evidence of these big eruptions happening that might have killed off these animals? And mercury is a great way to look at this, but you know, we don't see any blips in the mercury signature at the level where the bones are. So again, no evidence for big environmental disturbance or big volcanic eruptions happening, killing off these animals. And of course, we also wanted to go out and find new specimens to help you know, add data to, um, to the story. So here's, uh, here we are prospecting up to, in the upper right is my colleague Paige with a, a, a newly discovered uh, lower jaw, partial lower jaw um, of, of uh, Shonisaurus. And particularly exciting was the specimen that my colleague Connie there on the left is pointing to. Um, initially, as initially found, it was paired jaws going into the hill. And when we uh, ended up excavating it, it turned out to be most of a skull and skeleton of Shonisaurus, really well preserved. Here on the right, picture on the right side is we're mapping part of the block there. Um, 
And we also excavated a couple of other associated skeletons. Um, you can see them mapping there on the left. So we got new information as well from new specimens in addition to the ones that were collected by Charles Camp in the 50s and 60s um, that are in at the, Log the uh, Nevada State Museum in Las Vegas. Um, here's that jaw now that it's been expertly prepared uh, by our, our preparator Randy Johnson at the Natural History Museum of Utah. We have a, the, most of the rest of the skull, but this is just a piece of show. So one of the things you can see is that there are really big tooth sockets for pretty, pretty large teeth. And in my, in my hand here is one of those teeth from the same specimen. specimen. And it's a nice robust tooth. Um, and it has big cutting ridges on it. Um, so this is not sort of the, the tooth and jaw you expect for an animal that are just chasing after squid or something like that. These are the types of teeth and jaws you see in animals that eat larger prey. And so this seems to suggest that Shonisaurus was an apex predator. And while that might seem sort of reasonable, you know, to, to anyone who's like, well, that makes a lot of sense to me. Actually, uh, there's, it had been a lot of debate um, in fact, a lot of authors had suggested that, um, that in fact, Shonisaurus had very few teeth, if, if any at all, in its jaws. So here's Camp's reconstruction, and he just put a few teeth at the very tip of the jaws. But we, in fact, uh, can show that you know, th this animal had teeth throughout the length of both of its upper and lower jaws, and it was definitely eating big prey. It wasn't just eating soft body prey or using suction feeding or something like that. So that was a, a new insight uh, from some of these, these new specimens. Because even though the old specimens had skull material and some good skull material, for some reason the jaws were never really well preserved. Um, we also found new, new, other new specimens that were tiny. So what Neil is holding in his hand here is a tiny little uh, Pe a single bone from the paddle, but it's tiny, tiny. It's not from a giant ichthyosaur. This is from a really small individual. And we found um, out while prospecting, um, also found evidence of really small individuals. So what you have here is on the left of that photo, there's an adult vertebra. On, in the middle is a newborn baby vertebra that's just only slightly bigger than a penny. Um, so evidence of really young juveniles, newborns and embryos. Um, and in fact, this wasn't totally new because Camp had mentioned in his paper that um, one of the specimens had small bones in the belly region that looked to be uh, vertebrae or part of the backbone of an embryo. But weirdly, he never figured it. He never you know, had any illustrations or pictures. And he never described it beyond this one sentence. And thankfully, my colleague uh, Neil Kelly and uh, colleague Paige DiPolo went to the Nevada State Museum and looked at it carefully. And they were able to find the block that Camp was talking about and confirm that, indeed, there are little vertebrae. So this is on the right, upper right is a picture of what the block looks like. And then this is sort of an interpretive drawing. And there are these little nodule looking things that, that are uh, in fact embryonic vertebrae. We were able to remove one and micro CT scan it to confirm what, that it is embryonic. So yes, these, um, these an at least one of these animals was pregnant when it died. Um, and that confirms with sort of some of the other evidence of the other specimens we were finding of these newborns and uh, embryos at this site. That's not the only new slash old specimen. Um, so Neil was going through invertebrate fossils collected from Berlin Ichthyosaur State Park that were at uh, the museum in Berkeley. And so mixed in with these invertebrates, these ammonites and clams and whatnot, he found this jaw section that never got separated out. And it turns out that this jaw is a uh, newborn Shonisaurus jaw. So when, when we look at the cross section in a CT scan, it's very similar to the cross section of an adult. It's just the scale is much, much different. So what do we conclude from all this information? Well, first off, um, there's no evidence for beaching or mass mortality. So the water depth is, is you know, deeper than fair weather wave base. So that means it's away from the, um, 
away from the coastline, right? Um, it's not right on the beach. Um, we don't have any evidence that there was some big cataclysm that killed off these animals. And in fact, there's the fact that there's repeated different levels that have skeletons in them suggests that they're dying over time. Um, and that they are laying about on the, uh, on the ocean floor for a while before they're getting buried, and sometimes even maybe getting transported a little bit. And Shonisaurus is exceptionally common. In fact, this is the weirdest thing. We haven't found a single other marine reptile in this site. And if you look at other sites of the same age in North America and elsewhere in the world, you always find at least a few species of different marine reptiles of different sizes. And um, even when it's much less well sampled than what we see here. But that's not what we see. We have a few microscopic fish bits, one shark fin spine, and all the other vertebrate remains we found are Shonisaurus, this giant apex predator, which is totally the opposite of what you'd expect. Usually you find you know, a lot more of the base of the ecosystem, not a lot of the apex predator of the ecosystem. So kind of like Clevelandoid dinosaur quarry, it's an anomaly having all these big, pre one species of big predator being preserved there. And then finally, the demographics are really strange. We've got lots of adults and some embryos or newborns, but we've got no juveniles or subadults. So that's really bizarre. Why would you find that, right? So it's really, really strange pattern. All, um, and so what, is, what does this all mean, right? Well, the best that we can conclude is that this is um, evidence that Shonisaurus uh, came together in groups to reproduce, probably to give birth. Um, so may, the reason why we don't see um, all these other types of animals there and why we only have adults and newborns or embryos is that Maybe they were only congregating at certain times of the year in this place to give birth. And, you know, there's no way we can prove that for sure, but we really can't come up with any alternative good explanations that fit the data. And even the reviewers, to much to our surprise, the reviewers of the paper were like, yep, makes sense to us. So, um, and so that's what we think is the best explanation. So that's why we've got, you know, some juvenile, really young juveniles here as well as adults in this artist's reconstruction. Um, and this might seem far-fetched, but it's something that happens today. So gray whales, uh, they travel down to Baja, California to give birth as a very well-known example. And there are a lot of different types of large marine vertebrates today that um, exhibit grouping behavior for reproduction. So it seems to suggest that this very typical behavior that we see today uh, extends back at least 230 million years into the late Triassic period with, with uh, marine reptiles, this giant ichthyosaurus shonisaurus, which is pretty cool. But I think there's some even uh, more inter potentially more interesting things going on here um, in that, uh, you know, we see really giant ichthyosaurs. In fact, these are the, some of the largest ichthyosaurs ever. And what is that telling us more broadly about uh, about sort of Triassic ecosystems in the ocean. The Triassic was a really important time in ecosystems in the ocean. They totally were very, totally different from the ones that came before in the Permian um, because of this flourishing of marine reptiles. So before the Triassic, you really had almost no re uh, reptiles or any sort of limbed vertebrates in the, wa in the ocean. But in the Triassic, they really invade and take over and fill all these roles. And this is something that continued to the present day in terms of limbed vertebrates. You know, they eventually become mammals rather than reptiles for the most part, but it's something that's sort of ubiquitous uh, even today in that limbed vertebrates fill these larger roles. And this is a really complicated diagram, but there's just a couple things I want you to notice, so I'll walk you through it really quickly um, or, and, and, and sh point out what it's talking about. So um, the key thing is that the horizontal axis is time since the group evolved uh, in millions of years, and that the, the vertical axis is body size. So the higher you are up, the larger the body size. The other key thing to note is that purple are ichthyosaurs and uh, orange are whales. 
And so if we look at this, um, Shonisaurus is the largest ichthyosaur ever. So it's at the very top of this diagram in the purple here. And if we think about when ichthyosaurs originated, um, the end Triassic mass extinction, uh, one of the five largest mass extinction events ever, is just a few million years after Shonisaurus lived. And if you look at the purple, none of these branches ever get as big um, at, as Shonisaurus ever again. They don't get anywhere close after the end Triassic mass extinction. So that's really strange. Why did ichthyosaurs get really big early on in the Triassic and then what, after they survived for millions and million years after the extinction of um, the, the end Triassic mass extinction, but they never got as big again. So what's going on there? So we know that body size is really important for ecosystems. Um, many different ecological properties scale with body size, such as abundance, um, where you are in the food chain, uh, your diet, um, all sorts of different things. Um, and we know that large organisms use a disproportionate amount of resources in an ecosystem. So they have an outsized impact on those ecosystems. And so let's look at the patterns in body size of ichthyosaurs through the Triassic and early Jurassic. So the next few slides are all gonna look similar. The, um, the geologic time scale is horizontally across the top and then um, on the vertical, uh, I have a scale for body length of the ichthyosaur, and there'll be just little uh, color bars to indicate um, what the size of the different animals are. So quite early on in the middle Triassic, not long after ichthyosaurs evolved, um, we already get quite large ichthyosaurs, some, um, one including Simbospondylus youngorum that was in, uh, just published last year, is you know, somewhere around 12, 13 meters in length. So, um, we're talking about, you know, f almost 40 feet in length. Um, and it coexisted with this other animal, Thalatoarcton, that was about nine meters. Um, if we move a few million years forward in time, we have Shonisaurus here, popular, Shonisaurus popularis, and that's between 13 and 15 meters in length. Um, and We've worked elsewhere in Nevada now. We're starting to work in a place called the Pilot Mountains that also has Shonisaurus, and it's a similar size as well. But that animal is dwarfed by Shonisaurus sicaniensis from British Columbia from about 10 million years later in time that is almost 20 meters long. So somewhere between 55 and 60 uh, feet long, uh, a, the largest ichthyosaur ever to live that we know of. Um, you can see uh, Don Brinkman there standing next to the skeleton for scale. Um, so truly, truly enormous. These are, when we talk about things that are over 10 meters long, we're talking about whale-sized marine reptiles. And once we get into the last few million years of the Triassic period, the, the, um, the fossils become a bit more fragmentary and spotty, but they tell some clues. So here's a lower jaw and some vertebrae and limbs that also is an animal somewhere between 12 and 15 meters long based on comparisons with Shonisaurus. Um, and in the United Kingdom, there's other really big lower jaws that are um, of uh, at least the same length. They might even be, uh, be even longer, um, but they're, they're somewhere between 15 and and 20 meters long. And then um, finally, we get to the very end of the Triassic and a specimen that actually we're still working on, we're still excavating um, from Nevada uh, that was found in, that, we, that our team found in another place in Nevada. So I'm just showing you the quarry map here because uh, we haven't been able to, we haven't prepared all the bones yet. Um, we're still trying to prepare the bones in the lab, but, um, what you have preserved are a lot of ribs and some vertebrae, and it's an associated skeleton. And what's exciting about is where it is geologically. So I highlighted in red here is the extinction interval at this site. And the fossil we found, this ichthyosaur, is just a couple meters below the extinction level. So based on what we know, it is within about a couple hundred thousand years of the end Triassic mass extinction. 
And this is really exciting because it shows that these giant ichthyosaurs survived right up until the mass extinction event. They didn't go extinct, you know, a couple million years before. Um, here's a few rib segments that we have prepared. And the key thing is that the ribs are similar in size to Shonisaurus popularis. Um, and although we haven't found a lot of different parts of the skeleton yet, the ribs have a very characteristic sort of figure eight cross section that is characteristic of Shonisaurus and its relatives. So we think it's a relative of Shonisaurus of some sort. Um, just the last time we were out there, um, of course, the last day, two days in the field are when we, you know, found the most stuff, and, and so we have to go back. But um, up in the upper right-hand corner of the map is you see a bunch of parallel uh, lines, and these are um, five or six articulated ribs that are going into the hill. And at least based on the measurements we could take in the field, um, these ribs are as wide as the largest ichthyosaur ever. They rival uh, that British Columbia Shonisaurus in their width. So this animal could be easily um, over 15 uh, meters long and you know, up to maybe 18, 19 meters long. But we want to get it excavated and prepared before we say for sure. But certainly it's as big as Shonisaurus popularis. And it's re living right at the end of the Triassic, just a few thousand years before the extinction happens. Um, once we get into the Jurassic period, things change. So the first million or two years of the Jurassic, uh, ichthyosaurs are really small. Um, once you get to about 200 million years ago, you get animals like Temnodontosaurus platyodon. This is actually the first ichthyosaur skull ever found by Mary Anning. Um, and um, it's a big animal, but it's tiny compared to the ones we just talked about. It's only seven meters long. so. Uh, <laughs> uh, but its relatives start to get bigger during the early Jurassic. So we have another species of Temnodontosaurus that has a shorter snout but bigger skull with really big teeth for eating large prey. And it was probably an animal somewhere between 8 to you know, 10 meters long, maybe a little bit smaller, larger. Um, and by the time we get to um, about 180 million years ago, we have some really good fossils of Temnodontosaurus um, that show that Temnodontosaurus got up to about 10 meters long, but no, no longer. So big animal, 10 meters, that's still 30, over 30 feet, but not nearly as big as Shonisaurus or some of these Triassic animals. Um, incidentally, this uh, new specimen that got named the Rutland Sea Dragon, it was announced about a year ago, uh, got a lot of press. You can go on to, online to Sketchfab and check out a 3D model of the skeleton in the ground that they made. So it's, it's really cool, worth checking out. Um, and so if we sort of summarize this, if we look on the right side, this is all the different body sizes. And pr remember, sort of purple lavender colors are Triassic and blue colors are Jurassic. Hopefully you can see that the, the maximum body size in the Triassic was a lot bigger than anything in the Jurassic. There's a little bit of overlap, but things like Shonisaurus are much, much bigger than anything that ever lived after it in the Jurassic period. And so with the new specimen, we can show that um, these giant ichthyosaurs definitely persisted until the end Triassic extinction event. Um, but after the, and after the Triassic, we don't ever have, again, these truly giant forms that are much above 10 meters long. Um, and what we do know from other discoveries is that there are other marine reptiles that get really big, such as plesiosaurs, uh, during the Jurassic period. So what happened? Why didn't ichthyosaurs ever get truly gigantic again? Well, we know from work by, um, by many folks, including your speaker last month, Dr. Kathleen Ritterbush, who have studied the invertebrates across the end Triassic mass extinction, that there's a real change in the communities. The types of invertebrate animals that lived during, before the extinction are very different from the species and types that lived after the extinction event. So we know that there was a really big change in the composition of these ecosystems in the ocean um, as a result of this ext mass extinction event. And we know also that uh, body size is controlled a lot by how much energy and resources you need. Um, so if we look at whales here, toothed whales, as they get bigger, they 
become much less efficient in feeding. And it's only the giant filter feeders, the baleen whales, that actually get more efficient as they get bigger. So if you have to chase down your prey, the larger you are, the more energy you have to spend to get your food, right? And so eventually you get so big that you spend too much energy chasing your food and not enough time, you know, not enough food uh, to keep up. And so it can be, re it's really expensive in terms of resources and energy to be a really giant animal like Shonisaurus. Um, and it requires a really dependable source of high quality prey, right? Prey that's gonna give you a lot of calories and the nutrition you need. So you can imagine that with a mass extinction event with all these animals and organisms going extinct, you're not going to necessarily have a dependable prey source. You know, all of a sudden the things you eat could have gone extinct and that's going to cause you to go extinct. So it's, we, we suspect, this is just a hypothesis right now, but we infer that these giant Triassic ichthyosaurs uh, lost their prey sources during this extinction event um, and that caused a real change in the food web structure. Um, and as these ecosystems recovered during the Jurassic period, that giant apex predator role got filled by other types of marine reptiles. And so ichthyosaurs were never able to expand again back into that role of being the giant apex predator. And they ended up becoming specialized in actually as deep divers later on in the Jurassic period. Um, so it's really cool how, although we get excited about superlatives, you know, like the biggest and the meanest and all that, but those superlative animals like Shonisaurus can actually tell us a lot about how uh, these organisms interacted in their ecosystems and how they evolved through time um, across things like mass extinction events. And so I think that's one thing that makes Shonisaurus particularly cool beyond the fact of its just gigantic size. So with that, I want to thank everyone in the room and online for uh, attending, and I'm happy to, to take questions. Um, I think Jean said that she would uh, be the traffic controller for the questions online. So thank you. <laughs>